So this journey that we're going to take this year uh, begins with something, thank you, Ben, uh, that I think we can all agree on. It doesn't matter where your political loyalties lie or what your worldview is. It doesn't matter if you think January 6th was a full-blown insurrection that threw the country into a constitutional crisis, or if you think that ah, was just a little political dust-up. If you think we ought to grant citizenship to everybody, or we should finish building that big, beautiful wall on the southern border, none of that matters. There's one thing we can all agree on. The world is broken. This is not how things are supposed to be. I don't think there's a person anywhere in the world who would disagree with that. So beginning next week, our journey for this, this whole year begins by acknowledging what we already know, but sometimes don't want to admit. We're broken. Or as the theologians would say, we're fallen. In this first series, which starts next week, we're going to ask why. Why is the world broken? And who broke it? And how can it be rescued? And I'll give you this much of a preview. The problem is not what most people say it is. It's not unjust social structures. It's not oppressive political systems. It's not unfair economic arrangements. It's not racism. It's not any of the phobias. It's not even the internet. It's not social media. The problem is much more fundamental. The problem is sin. Now, the world and every human being in it is fallen. And until we understand what happened in Eden, we cannot appreciate what it takes to repair the broken or lift up the fallen. Now, the thing is, we, we don't like to talk about sin. Half the time, we're kind of embarrassed to, to mention the word. And, and for much of the world, you can spell it with three letters, but it's become a four-letter word. And you don't dare utter it in polite company. And when we hear the word sin, we think, well, that must be about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. When we talk about it in church, or if we dare use it in discourse outside church, people immediately divert auxiliary power to their shields. We get defensive because we figure we're about to be accused or judged or condemned. And that's one of the reasons we need to revisit this concept of sin. Because sin, as it's defined in the Bible, is not just immoral or unethical behavior. Of course, it includes our behavior, but it goes so much deeper than that. It's more like a condition. And it affects every system and culture and ideology and organization and government and authority and structure in the world, but it's not just systemic. It's personal. David put it this way in Psalm 53. Everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. And Paul echoed that in Romans 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And even John, who is called the apostle of love because he talks about love so much, even John said, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Until we acknowledge that sin is the problem and that the problem is mine, you and I will live with and in this brokenness. But if we are willing 
to tell the truth about our world and about ourselves. There's not just hope. There's a promise. Now, the Bible has a word for that truth-telling. The word is confession. If you are ready, here's another thing we're going to invite you to do this morning. You're in the band, but you're also, we're all going to pray together, okay? If you're ready to tell the truth, we want to invite you to pray this prayer as Shannon leads us. If you're not ready, I hope you'll listen carefully so that you'll know what it sounds like when you are. Gracious God, my sin is too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what my lips tremble to name, what my heart can no longer bear, and what has become for me a consuming fire of judgment. Set me free from a past I cannot change, and grant me grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, amen.